Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, uh, the podcast from the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. I'm John Roberti. I'm your host today for today's episode, which is What in the World? Understanding the Web of Global Antitrust. 25 years ago, we thought about antitrust as being a U.S. problem. And there has been an absolute mushrooming over time of antitrust globally. Consumer protection as well. But today we're going to focus mostly on antitrust and mostly on trying to understand how all of the different statutes, regulations, regulators, how they all fit together and also understanding um, how regulators work together around the globe. My co-host today is Ricardo Wollery. Ricardo is an associate with the Skadden Arps Law Firm, and he works in their antitrust group. Hi, Ricardo. Hey, John. Ricardo, why is it important for us to understand developments in international antitrust, and specifically how all this global antitrust regulation works together? So I think a lot of folks know that the Federal Trade Commission is one of the two agencies uh, uh, in charge of enforcing antitrust laws in the U.S. And some folks know that there nebulously may be some European regulator because they've read the news and seen Google and Facebook and all those folks uh, involved in matters in, in the EU. But not a lot of folks know about how international antitrust works. And so I think it's important for us to explore a little bit, uh, you know, uh, how international antitrust policies are promoted, how international antitrust enforcement occurs, and uh, the FTC's role, Federal Trade Commission's role, in both things. And who's our guest today? Our guest today is Randy Tritel. Randy is the director of the FTC's Office of International Affairs, and Randy is also the co-chair of the ABA Antitrust Law Section's International Task Force. What do we want to get out of today's program? So today we want to have a discussion about, you know, what the landscape of international antitrust looks like. We want to talk about how and why the FTC engages with its counterparts in different parts of the world. And we want to figure out, you know, how the ABA's antitrust law section plays a role in the development of international enforcement, international antitrust policy development. Okay. Let's bring in our guest. Yes. Randy? Welcome to the program. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ricardo. Delighted to be here. So, Randy, you and I go back a few years. Um, I've been trying to reflect on this. How long have you been with the FTC? Well, a uh, comp- more complex question than it might sound, John. Uh, this is my second stint. I'm one of those FTC recidivists. I was there for um, eight years following law school. Uh, I started in the Consumer Protection Bureau as a staff lawyer. I had a great opportunity to go to work for a brilliant and young bureau director, Tim Muris. Uh, after that, I had another great opportunity to go to work for a dynamic and also brilliant new commissioner, Terry Calvani, who became chairman and uh, became uh, what they then called executive assistant to the chairman. Um, I then left for private practice. I spent 12 years at the Weill Gottschall and Manju's firm, six of those in New York. And then they gave me the opportunity to open their office in Brussels, Belgium. And I spent six years there. I then returned to the FTC when uh, that opportunity arose and have been there uh, for 21 years since then. 21 years doing the international bit. That's correct. And you know, I come into your office from time to time and whine about my international problems. So we know each other. We know each other fairly well. Um, I view you as being one of the people who has been responsible for seeing this proliferation of antitrust. Uh, what has it been like to watch in 21 years to 
to watch all of the, you know, all of these new regimes take on antitrust statutes. Well, when you say responsible for the proliferation, John, I'm not sure if that's a, a compliment or an accusation, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's arisen or organically uh, around the world. I think a lot of countries saw the, the benefit of uh, how competition could play a role in, in their economies and, and, and their developments, and it's been exciting to watch that develop. Uh, we're not responsible for that, but what we try to do at, at the FTC, uh, and at this point, I, let me mention two things. First of all, that I'm speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the, the, the commission, and that our international work is, is done jointly with our colleagues at the uh, Justice Department's Antitrust Division. Uh, but what we do is uh, in, engage with our colleagues both to support the FTC's domestic enforcement program and to promote convergence around sound policies. What do you mean by convergence? What does that mean? Well, you have to understand now that there are over 120 competition laws around the world, and these occur in countries with very different um, backgrounds, different uh, histories and cultures, different legal systems, um, more often civil than, than common law, um, with, at different stages of development and different types of economies, different statutes that are uh, governing their, their antitrust regimes. Um, but it would be a problem if those 120 plus regimes all were, went off in their own direction without regard to, to others. Uh, to uh, in, enforce their laws. Now, despite all those differences, I think there's a broad set of common principles around which uh, we can converge or, or agree on, on antitrust policy. In the United States, we call it consumer welfare, although, as you know, there's some debate about what that means and if that's, that's the right standard. But what we hope to do is achieve some level of consensus around the basic economic principles that inform antitrust enforcement so that we can reach compatible results in cross-border matters. And so, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ricardo. So, Randy, uh, how do you go about, in light of all of these differences across countries, history, legal regimes, so forth, um, in getting folks to actually align and actually agree on some of these common principles? I would mention three ways, Ricardo. Uh, one is through our bilateral relations, another is through our activities in multilateral organizations, and a third is through our technical assistance program. Um, in terms of bilateral relations, we maintain very close ties with our, especially with our key partners around the world. With many of them, we have bilateral cooperation agreements that provide a framework for cooperating, and there are also such frameworks through, through the OECD. What's, um, what's the OECD? The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a uh, large-scale multilateral organization that promotes uh, good policy in, uh, among the more developed countries of, of the world, but they have a very active competition committee in which we participate along with our colleagues and discuss the key issues of the day. So in addition to the OECD, what other bilateral, bilateral organizations do you participate in? Well, the bilateral relations are one-on-one, are -on -one, so we will be in constant contact by email, by phone, and so forth with our colleagues, for example, in Brussels, in Canada, in Mexico, uh, and, and many, many others, so that when cases come up that we're both looking at, we have a um, relationship that we can use to discuss our, our cases, um, possibly with waivers from the parties to discuss confidential information, which we, we can come to if, if you'd like. Um, and then in terms of the OECD and, and, and similar bodies, uh, the, these are multilateral uh, bodies that involve um, dozens or sometimes over 100 participants. So the, uh, the OECD has, I think, now thir 35 members and a group of observers uh, uh, with whom we discuss competition policy. But a very important one is the International Competition Network, which um, the FTC helped found in, in 2001. And that has well over 130 members, and that is a virtual network of almost all the world's competition agencies um, in which we pursue um, good policy, um, good investigative practices. Uh, we 
develop best practices on substantive analysis, and we promote cooperation amongst our, our members. How, how do you do that? How, how does the ICN, what are, the, what are some of the tools in the toolbox that the ICN uses to, to help with that? Well, it's organized into uh, working groups uh, along substantive lines. So there's a merger working group that we recently finished uh, three years of, of co-chairing, one on cartels, one on unilateral conduct, uh, one on competition advocacy and one on agency effectiveness as, as well as some some special projects. So agencies will sign up to participate in those groups and importantly, along with members of the private sector who could be from law firms, companies, universities, uh, economic consulting firms, etc. And, and we work together on specific projects. It's not a think tank. So, for example, one of the earliest projects was an effort to harmonize to some extent, the merger notification and review procedures around the world, which were burgeoning and threatening to impose costs and burdens on the international uh, merger front. Um, so we set out with our colleagues to develop uh, good practices in, in that area that would get more agencies onto the same page. And that was successful, notwithstanding that many of the agencies with which we were working had statutes and, and rules that didn't live up to those standards, but they understood that it was important to set, uh, if you will, a, a gold standard for um, international c convergence um, for when they had the opportunity to, uh, to amend their, their laws or when new laws were being enacted, and, and that resulted in a substantial movement toward those best practice standards over the years. If, if I may shift uh, the conversation a little bit. So you mentioned that you've got several hundred countries or scores of countries involved in some of these multilateral organizations. And at, at some point, they'll sit on some of like the working committees, for example. Uh, but who are some of the smaller countries? Who are some of the newer countries with antitrust regimes? And uh, how significant a voice do they have at the table in, in, in some of these bilateral organizations? That's a great question, Ricardo. I, I want to uh, if you'll indulge me, come back one moment to another uh, ICN project that we just uh, did a lot of work on, and that's in the area of procedural fairness in investigations. A, a, a sensitive topic, but uh, an important topic um, with many countries having procedural rules and due process standards that are a lot different from what we're used to in the United States. And, and we at the FTC were leaders within the ICN of developing procedural fairness, best practice standards that have just culminated in agreed recommended practices in the ICN. And that sits alongside another document, um, competition agency procedures uh, that to which uh, over 60 countries have now, agencies have now um, signed up. So we were very proud of, of those accomplishments among others. Now, as to your question about uh, smaller agencies and agencies in developing countries, it's very important to us in the ICN and, the, and in the competition community that this be inclusive of, uh, of developing countries. And there's a big focus on orienting work to uh, in, in include them. So they're um, most welcome and encouraged to join our working groups. We try to make leadership roles available to them in, in chairing our working groups. And we want to make sure that the international best practice standards that we develop are suitable for smaller agencies, uh, are adaptable for them, um, and that we can help them achieve the best practice standards to which we uh, to we aspire. And uh, we, we do that, including through the, the FTC's very extensive uh, technical assistance program, which I can talk about if you'd like. Yeah, I, I've done a merger filing in Papua New Guinea, but um, uh, <laughs> what, tell, tell us a little bit about the technical assistance program. Sure. We're very proud of that. It originated around 1990 uh, when uh, the Berlin Wall fell and uh, there was a lot of transition to market economies going on in Central and Eastern Europe. The FTC and DOJ immediately sent advisors under a program organized by the U.S. Agency for International Development to help them uh, implement competition policy as part of their transition. And that program, uh, which started in Poland and Hungary and what was then uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, has grown and uh, all around the world now, uh, in including uh, supported directly by the FTC, um, so that we train 
news staff officials in uh, all around the world, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in Africa. We help countries when they would like assistance in drafting their statutes, when they'd like assistance on how to set up a competition agency, um, uh, on substantive analysis, on how to conduct investigations. Uh, we send trainers sometimes for a, uh, for a week, sometimes uh, for a short conference, and often for periods of six months and more where our staff live in country and go to work every day in, in the agency to, to train their, their staff. So, Randy, one, one more question. I, I think we'd like to turn in a second to, to the antitrust law section's role in, in, in this. But before we do that, I want to ask you a question about convergence. Maybe we could think about convergence as concentric circles, right? And how much, how much they overlap. And from where you're sitting, right, my sense is that you see only a little bit, maybe a little bit of a sliver that is, that is non-concentric, uh, is that fair? I mean, do you think you've been fairly successful? If if I go to two different agencies with the exact same set of facts, seems my experience is it's fairly likely I get to the, I get to, it's generally likely that I get to the same result. I mean, is that your sense as well that that convergence is is generally working? Well, let me break that down a bit, bit John. It's a great question. First of all, I, I should point out that we're. We use the term convergence rather than harmonization. At one point, there was an effort to have a WTO sort of competition code that that could have frozen competition policy in, in a particular point in, in time dictated by a trade organization. We thought that was a bad idea. So what we're talking about is a type of soft law convergence. Um, and I would further break it down into areas of law. So I think if you were to bring a cartel's a price fixing scenario, you would find an astounding degree of similarity. Although when you get further into that, into whether it's criminal and, and leniency programs, um, there, there, there are differences, un, understandably. Um, if you were to bring a merger to two different agencies, I think you'd find substantial but not complete convergence. You might find agencies that would be more aggressive in the area of non-horizontal mergers than we would be in the United States, for, for example. If you were to bring a unilateral conduct case, a monopolization case, uh, and shop that around, you'd get more divergence in, in the answers that, that you would get. And look, this stuff is hard, especially for the, for the newer agencies. They're often arising in economies that don't have a, a market um, background. They don't have the academic um, infrastructure that we have in, in the U.S. Um, they may be dealing with lack of resources, with lack of independence, with mandates to incorporate non-competition factors like employment and industrial policy. So um, we, we aim for convergence, we strive for that, but we understand that there are still different ways of doing things around the world. We've been relatively um, encouraged by what we've seen, but, but it's, it's very much an unfinished project and there are holes in it and there are areas where, where convergence still has a, a substantial way to go. Thanks, Randy. Uh, what role does the ABA uh, antitrust law section play in the development of, of international antitrust law? Well, we're, we're proud to play what we think is a very significant part in that. Um, in, in the International Task Force, which I chair with, with co-chair with Tad Lipsky, um, we look for opportunities to have the antitrust section, often in conjunction with other sections of the ABA, particularly the international law section, uh, submit comments in response to consultations that other countries and agencies hold when they are proposing new statutes, law, uh, regulations, or, or guidelines. So if a country today is thinking of changing their, their merger law from voluntary to mandatory or changing their leniency standards or, or just about anything, it's typical and, and good practice now to put those out for, for public comment. And the antitrust section assembles a, an expert group to draft a comment that's eventually approved by our council and submitted. And um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on that. We've had many agencies who specifically now request our input. We've had many um, no, no, notes of gratitude from agency heads for helping them think through their draft rules. Um, and uh, we, we now, we do about 20, 25 of these 
per, per year. And I think we're looked at as a, uh, a, a respected prof- uh, source of professional advice to uh, countries around the world in developing their, uh, their laws and rules. How many, how many comments did the ABA antitrust section do last year, if you know? I think we're in the low twenties, um, and that, and that's been been pretty standard. So almost almost two a month. That that's correct. Yes, and and on all sorts of issues. And another thing we do is issue a report every year once the regulations have been issued, and we see how we're doing in terms of our success rate of our recommendations being adopted. So we we can learn from that. But we've we think we've had a significant role in influencing the. Uh, the course of, of development of competition laws around the world. Randy, you obviously love practicing in this international competition space. What is it? What is it that you love? Why do you like it so much? Well, there are, there are a whole bunch of reasons, John, why I, I love doing this, and, and they haven't been able to get rid of me for for a long time. First of all, the FTC is a fabulous place to work. Uh, you may see how well we do on these uh, federal employee sur- surveys. We've been under Terrific leadership uh, in my 20 years back consistently with a lot of support from the top. And I have just a fabulous team to work with in, in my office every day. Uh, in addition, we, we like to think we're doing our bit to help uh, American consumers in particular and to make uh, world economy run best for the benefit of, of businesses and ultimately American consumers, because that's what it's all about. My office gets to play a role both in case enforcement and in the development of, of policy and through our assistance program. So I find it uh, very rewarding. Randy, if, do you have any advice for young lawyers that are interested in maybe getting into the international antitrust area? I would say the first thing to do is to become an expert on on U.S. antitrust law. Uh, I maintain that you can be an effective antitrust lawyer on the international scene only with a, if if you're an American lawyer, only with a solid grounding in in U.S. law off of which to... uh, to, to base that. And, and other than that, um, a, uh, a sense of, of curiosity and open mind about how others uh, do things so that you can in, engage respectfully and, and professionally with, with them. Um, yeah, I, I found uh, to the extent that I dabble in this area, I found the, the open mindedness to be really, really important because a lot of times it's really strange. A lot of times people don't like the Americans coming in and telling them how to do stuff. They like it a lot better when you actually listen to them and try to try to, you know, collaborate on a solution. Exactly. Na- naturally enough, you have to be a, a, a good listener to, un- to understand and, and to have a sense of humility about what you do. So, Randy, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you. Tell us something surprising or unusual about yourself, something that if we didn't know you, if we only knew you professionally, that we wouldn't maybe know. Okay. Well, um, well, I'll throw out two different things. Uh, in, in, my, in my spare time, I, I now serve as the president of the Washington, D.C. area uh, board of directors for the American Jewish Committee. And on a, on a lighter note, I never miss a Jimmy Buffett concert uh, on what's uh, sometimes referred to as a, as a parrot head. So favorite B-side Jimmy Buffett song. I mean, I, look, you could, you could talk, talk to me about Margaritaville what, 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 and nobody will believe you're really a Jimmy Buffett fan. What's, what's your Jimmy Buffett song? What's your go-to Jimmy Buffett song? Oh, there's so many, John. Uh, let's go with uh, Far Side of the World. And if you were standing up on a karaoke night, would you ask for Jimmy Buffett? Uh, with many drinks, I guess I would. Okay. Well, with, with that, I think it's important now to go to our next segment, which we call Our Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. So, Randy, I have a, a com- camouflage hat in my hand. I'm going to hand it to you, and there are a series of index cards in the hat. If you pick out the index card, we're going to ask you the question on the card. So, yeah. Great. Okay. You've picked question number one. Uh, Randy, what are you currently reading? Uh, excuse me. Tell us. Um, yeah, what are you currently reading? What 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 is your what is what novel is on your bedside? Well, gosh, what I'm what I'm reading now is uh, 
It is not a novel. It's this book, Sapiens, uh, about sort of the history of human race. Uh, it's an interesting book. So. It's just, and is that, is that a, 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 how long is that book? It's like 400 pages. It's on the Kindle, so it's hard to say. <laughs> What, why did you why did you pick that in the first place? What was interesting about it or appealing about it too? I got lots of good recommendations for it and get some more insight into our, our species uh, and it, what, what it was like back then. That will do it for today's show. We will be back next week with our next episode of Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by the ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent those of their employer or other organization. If you like what you heard and would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org slash antitrust. If you have suggestions for topics or are interested in participating in a future episode, please reach out to us at Our Curious Amalgam at AmericanBar.org. Until next time, thank you for listening.